Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, if you would, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. If you are new or just visiting for this weekend, we've been in the book of Acts learning what Christianity is and how Christians live their lives through the example of the first church, the, the first church of Jesus Christ. And Paul is on his second missionary journey sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus to anyone he can. And we are going to be in Thessalonica and Berea and Athens all in one day. So buckle up, we're gonna cover quite a few verses of scripture. I wanna show you a map of where they are and how big his journey is as a missionary with Silas and Timothy and uh, Luke is somewhere in there, but he stops and hangs out in Philippi actually now. But we're in the top left corner in Macedonia in the orange. I know it's kind of small for you to see, um, but he is there in Philippi on the top of that, on the right of Macedonia. Then he's going to go down to Thessalonica, Berea, and then he's going to head into Achaia, which there is Athens. And so a very Greek-dominated society. And uh, he is going to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ there. And then later on, we'll read in the coming weeks that he makes his way all the way through the ocean, through the Mediterranean Sea there, and back up to Antioch. So this is the second missionary journey. And today you'll learn uh, how to evangelize, some tips on evangelism. You'll also learn how much God loves you and how he wants you to know him. And he wants to be known. And, you know, we too are learning how to know God. Amen? And he preaches and speaks to atheists. And he speaks to agnostics. He speaks to polytheists, people who believe in many gods, especially in the Greek culture. And so he has his hands full, and he's going to need the help of God, and God certainly helps him. We're going to be in verse 1 of chapter 17. It says this, Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia, and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who listened were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, in other words, they believed, along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. Let me just pause there for a moment before we see the reaction of some people. But what we see here is, is Paul knows he needs to explain to the Jews, but there's also some God-fearing Gentiles who have began to worship God but not necessarily believe in Jesus. He needs to explain to them who Jesus is. He's connecting the dots and he's saying that he had to suffer first, rise again, and that he truly is the Messiah. And this would be very hard to convince them because they didn't believe the Messiah would suffer, they believed the Messiah would actually conquer physically and rule and reign. But he did rule and reign over sin and death. That's what we as Christians believe. And this is what Jesus was teaching, that the greatest opposition in your life isn't physical world powers, it's actually spiritual powers. It's actually your separation from God, your distance from God because of sin. That's the greatest enemy in your life. And he was telling the Jews that you must be saved through Jesus Christ because of sin. That was what Jesus was fighting and doing for them. And so he would teach them that Jesus must suffer. He would most likely go to Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant, how his, his trans, or he was pierced for our transgressions, that he was a sheep led to the slaughter. He would most likely talk about Psalm 16, how the scriptures prophesy that he would not rot in the grave. He would go through the scripture and the prophecies to, con to try to convince them to reason with them as much as he can. But in the end, it would be up to God, right? And it would be up to them whether to believe or not and to receive. And so he goes through this and even says he is the Messiah. And we see that some believe, even God-fearing Gentiles believe. Verse 5 says this, but some of the Jews were jealous so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. Oh my goodness. They had to manufacture a mob. 
They had to manufacture a riot. They had to make things up. Let's keep going. It says they attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. So Jason must be a believer. And not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they are disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them to his home. They're all guilty of treason against Caesar for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. See how they twisted that. They're not worshiping Caesar, they're worshiping this Jesus. And so they use that against them. The people of the city as well as the city council were thrown into turmoil by these reports. So the officials forced Jason and the other believers to post bond, and then they released them. Apparently, they didn't have enough evidence to keep them or to punish them, so they posted bond only, and then they were released. It's interesting that there has to be this manufactured mob because they couldn't find real evidence that would actually cause an issue in this society. It was okay for what they did, but we had to understand something We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with powers of the unseen realm, spiritual powers. What we're seeing here isn't just someone jealous. We're seeing a spirit of jealousy. In other words, we're seeing the anti-Christ spirit in action. The anti-God spirit of that day that still exists today. Do you know what I'm saying? And the anti-God spirit, the anti-Christ spirit that's against God, which we know is the enemy, the devil, and anyone who would be willing to be his pawns and to be his puppets and to be used by him, they will stir up a riot or they will stir up opposition against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we don't wrestle, wrestle with flesh and blood, but people can unfortunately be convinced and be used by the devil. Do you follow me on that? But ultimately we care for those people and we are concerned for them too. And we know behind them is the devil. Last week I taught that the girl that was demon possessed, she had what they call in the Greek ventriloquism spirit. And what I was teaching there was that the devil was using her like a puppet to get his ways and to do his things. And unfortunately that's happening in our world today too. I just want you to know this though, that yes, there is a spirit against God and Christ, but we still win today and we win in the future because God is greater than the spirit in this world. Amen. Amen. Despite this rocky reception, even though there were believers, thank God, people responded to Paul's message. They believed. You know how hard it is to get people who are deeply rooted in their beliefs to believe? It's very difficult. So obviously God must have opened their hearts to receive as well, and they confessed and repented and believed. But this is a beautiful thing that happens here. So Paul later on writes to the Thessalonian church. This is years later, he writes to them. In 1 Thessalonians 1.8, it says this, and now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it. In other words, What Paul accomplished there was so powerful that all the places around Macedonia and further out, they knew about the Thessalonica reputation and their faith in God. So God thrived. The gospel thrived in that place, even if there was a manufactured riot and resistance from the anti-spirit or anti-God spirit. Amen. So don't be discouraged if if we don't see the fruit you want to see, but always be happy. At least one person gives their life to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Verse 10 says this, that very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue and the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. I love this. It says they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Can I just stop for a moment? Can I just encourage you? If you're not a believer in Christ or God, Let's say you're an atheist, agnostic, maybe now they call them none. They don't have, they want nothing to do with any of it, any religion of any form. Can I just encourage you to be like the Bereans, to have an open heart, to be willing to search? Because if this is true, and we believe it is as Christians, it's life or death, amen? 
And so I just want to encourage you, give God a chance. If you're going to be stout and, and, and convicted in that, that, that this doesn't matter, and, you, know, you must have some form of conviction that you're right and this is wrong if that's where you're going to stand. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong and you miss it? Can I encourage you, if you're watching online or you're in this room, give Jesus a chance. Amen. Like the Bereans. You know, those who live in rebellion tend to have a harder heart towards God, but also those who have had a lot of pain in their life tend to have a harder heart towards God. God spoke to us today to say, I see you in your situation, and I'm calling out to you, seek me. Seek me and you will find me. Do not let the troubles of this world cloud you from the truth of God. All right? All right. As a result of this preaching in Berea, it says many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. And you could say, too, as a result of them searching the scriptures, many believed. But when some Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there and stirred up trouble. Come on, man. Leave Paul and them alone. I mean, but isn't that like the devil? And to, to be just a pain in their side. And even in your life, when things are going good, he don't like it. And here we see things are going well in Berea, and they have a problem with it. And they're, and they're jealous. Even as humans, they're jealous. The believers acted at once. They've kind of gained some wisdom from the last place. And so verse 14, the believers acted at once, sending Paul onto the coast while Silas and Timothy remained behind. Those escorting Paul went with him all the way to Athens and they returned to Berea with instructions for Silas and Timothy to hurry and join him. Verse 16 says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Church, are we deeply troubled by what we see in our world? I think it's powerful that he stops long enough to just associate himself with the community. He looks around to observe. He watches. As a good evangelist would, he first is learning and listening to the culture around him. And he's not mad at people. No, he's deeply troubled by the things they have fallen for. And I just, I just want to challenge us to be careful that we're not so caught up in the world that we're not deeply troubled by it. Because that's what makes Paul different. He was separate, he was holy, he was counterculture, he was saved and sanctified by Jesus Christ. So he wasn't going there to enjoy all the false worship and things that they do. Instead, he was deeply troubled by it. And may our hearts break for what we're seeing in our society, in our world. And may we not just be like, oh, you know, someone else will take care of it. Or I'll let Pastor Ryan evangelize my neighbor. I'm joking, but I hope not. <laughs> no, may we be so deeply troubled that we're deeply moved to do something about it. And let's keep reading on this, this scripture and, uh, for, our, for the context here. Verse 17, he went to the synagogue to reason. So right away, he's moved to do something about it with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers when he told them what Jesus and his resurrection, or told them about Jesus and his resurrection. They said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. So these are deep thinking uh, philosophers Epicureans, Stoics, they had different views of gods or they had uh, no view of certain gods. They had different view of materialism. Um, I, I have long paragraphs. I won't have time to read to you today, but they did not believe in what Paul was saying to the point that they said he's babbling on. In the Greek, it actually has to do with this concept 
of birds picking seeds up in random different places. What they were saying was, is this guy is like, he doesn't have a coherent system of thinking and he doesn't have a system of belief. He's kind of everywhere talking about these random foreign gods possibly. And so they wanted, they, they didn't think that Paul was actually talking about anything that made sense. But, but come on, how many know that by now, after we've read so many things about Paul, he makes sense. Sure, there were some things he said that were difficult at times, but you're about to read here in a moment that he made total sense. But to someone who doesn't want to believe or to someone who's blinded by this world and all their other gods that they worship, they're going to go, well, that doesn't make any sense because it's not what they want. You will often find that you will run into people that they want God to fit their life. And if he doesn't, then I don't want anything to do with your Jesus or God. That's what you're going to encounter when you're reaching people. And just keep that in mind and pray for them. So they called him this babbler that doesn't have a system of thinking. It doesn't, it's not systematic, even though it is. And, you know, it doesn't phase him. He just continues to speak and teach them. Verse 19 says, then they took him to the high council of the city. So now he earns a spot in the high council. I want you to consider Greek culture, outdoor amphitheater, possibly. And there's this high council of Greeks and others coming together to talk, including Jews. And it says this, come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. And then Luke adds this little verse here to make us understand the context. It should be explained that all the Athenians as well as the foreigners in Athens seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Now, I think Paul was like that too. God is using the perfect person for where he is because Paul was a deep thinker too. Paul spent his whole life uh, in the Jewish culture and studying all the laws and everything and processing things with the Pharisees and others because he was highly regarded as someone who knew the law inside and out. God is so good. He knows how to put people in the right place at the right time. Amen? So, he goes into this place where everyone thinks all the time. But he doesn't need just his thinking cap on. He needs the spirit of God cap on. Amen? <laughs> Sound like a teacher right there. I want to encourage us in this way. We need Christians who would diligently study and graciously reason with those who are misguided and believe differently than us. We actually need what we call Christian apologists. We need Christians who study the scriptures well, that know them well, but also know how to communicate and share them graciously and humbly. An apologist is someone who knows evidence of God and of faith and the Christian faith and knows other religions as well and knows other positions as well and is able to reason with people back and forth. And just don't, no, don't take me wrong. I think all Christians should know the word of God. Amen. And, and God can also give you what to say. And we're going to see that in a moment. But I want to encourage you, if you've been feeling pulled in your heart to go deeper in this position in, or in this uh, position in the church, so to say, or this uh, member of the body of Christ who, who loves to have conversations with people and evangelize them by having those discussions or debates with people in a nice way, we call those apologists. And I love apologetics because they're willing to get into that realm and that arena of thinking and depth, but they also handle themselves so well that no one's offended by the time they, now, no, 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 I take that back. People do get offended if you have convictions on things, but they handle themselves so, we, so well that people are moved by their compassion on how they deliver their defense. If you have been feeling that tug, please keep going and study apologetics. We need you in the body of Christ, amen? And we also have, shameless plug, we have a small group coming up in September. It's been happening last year, it's gonna happen again this year on apologetics. And so if you're interested in that and you feel that tug, so you can reason with people, we will have that up in September for you, okay? All right. Second thing before we move on, take time to listen and learn about your audience before sharing the message of Jesus Christ. 
he knew the audience because he took time to get acquainted with the city that he was in. And so let me, let me exemplify that here in our next portion of scripture. So he's before the council. Verse 22 says this. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Remember that amphitheater kind of vibe, outdoor amphitheater with seats going up and it's like Greek culture. Let's say he's in that moment. He's in that place, okay? Can you picture him saying this with me? Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious in every way. For as I walk, or for as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. This God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. Now, how many know what a shrine is? You may have seen this in other countries. It's usually an altar or a stone or a place, and you'll see flowers, and you'll see candles lit, and pictures, and food, all these offerings that people bring to this God that they have, and maybe they want some kind of favor, or they want some kind of blessing from this God, and so they'll do anything they can to do that. Well, now they have one to the unknown God. It's like an insurance policy just in case we missed one. Like we have the food God, the water God, the good weather God, the fertility God. But if we miss any gods, we got this altar, so we're covered. And Paul picks up on this. And he says, let me tell you about the God you're probably referring to. Now, he's not saying that God is the unknown God. He's using this as a means to evangelize them. He's saying, let me tell you about the God who's greater than all the other gods. Okay, so let's, go, let's keep going forward in this so we can see what he says. He is, verse 24, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. In other words, you exist right now. You're hearing me talk to you. The apostle Paul is talking to you because God made us and he made us with ears and mouths. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. You can make shrines, you can make altars, but you won't find God in them. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He's too great to have needs. He is the one who provides all the needs. He says, he says as he himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. From one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. Wow, isn't that powerful? God created all people through one man. That was through Adam. And then Eve. So we all come from one person. It's, that's mind-blowing to think about. But God made them. And then it says this. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. So where they would live, where would nations be, where would people groups be? He determined those things, but he still had a plan for all of them. His purpose was this, for the nations to seek after God and perhaps fill their way toward him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. See, we heard a word earlier. If we seek him, we will find him. If we seek him with all, our, all of our hearts. I love this part so far. I'm gonna stop for just a moment. I love this so much because what Paul's saying is, is that God is not confined into something that man has made. It's impossible. He's greater than all these things. You can't put God in a box like that. But it goes further. God wants to have a relationship with us. He made us. We're not, it's not a creator-creature relationship. It's like a parent-child relationship. He longs to be in a relationship with us and you can't have a relationship with shrines and, and altars and little, little idols or wooden carven images. In fact, when they fall over, you have to pick them up. He says that in Isaiah. God is greater than all the gods you worship. He's, he's preaching and he's appealing to their hearts about this. He's not trying to insult them and all their beliefs. He's just, he just cares about them knowing the truth. Verse 29 says, and since this is true, 
We shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmanship from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times. But now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. When it says overlooked there, some people have misinterpreted that to say that they had not sinned and they weren't guilty. They were guilty. God's just so merciful and gracious, he didn't punish them for that. But now, okay, now he has one, there's one person he's brought into the picture, and it's Jesus. And now he's calling all people to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Jesus said that about himself, John 14, 6. There is no other God except for the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same God that is in Jesus Christ, amen? He's saying it's time to now turn to him. Repent of your sins and turn to him. Verse 31, for he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Who is that? Jesus. Now, did you catch that? Jesus is going to judge everyone. And a lot of times we don't think that because we read in the New Testament, he says, I have not come to condemn the world or to to judge the world, but come to save. Well, he will judge. and, And there is still judging that took place. He corrected his disciples. He corrected believers. He corrected the Pharisees and things like that. But talking about end times judgment, Jesus is the one that does that. Why? Because he was perfect. He's the only one qualified to do it. And at the appointed time, he would judge the entire world. And the only way that we go to heaven is if we have faith in Jesus Christ because we repented of our sins and we believe in Jesus alone, not any other gods, not ourselves, but Jesus, and we will have eternal life with him. The opposite is hell. And that is the stark, brutal, honest, loving truth from God's word. And you're ready if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And he has not been hiding. Let me start landing the plane here. God isn't hiding. God has revealed himself in creation, in Jesus Christ, and through our testimonies so that we would repent and turn to him and worship him alone. In creation, we call that general revelation. God revealed himself in creation, even in us as created beings. Psalm 19, one through six, anyone see the, uh, the stars recently? Anyone see the, I believe, was it the, uh, the meteor? Not meteor, I said meteor the first service, oh my goodness. The meteor shower, I guess I was right, yeah. Anyone see the meteor shower recently? No, yeah, neither did I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was at the ocean, though, this past weekend. How beautiful is that? The vast ocean. Well, Psalm 19, if we pull that up here, check this out. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. The heavens are speaking of God's intelligent design of creation. Now, you see that, and it's a poetic, beautiful explanation that God is revealing himself in creation, but scientists see natural laws or all the properties that are so fine-tuned, Christian scientists, that are so fine-tuned, they say there must be a God, an intelligent creator, an intelligent designer. I don't have the time to go into that today, but in the future, we will do a series on this. Just know that God's handiwork is all over creation. Look at, look at Romans 1. To keep going further on this, they know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. 
Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. If we read the rest of that chapter, it actually says that, tr- that the truth has been suppressed by mankind's wickedness. It's the godlessness and the wickedness of our world that causes people to not believe what is right in front of them. And how many know that can happen? How many know that you can have the truth right in front of you but turn a blind eye because you don't simply want to believe it? That is the world we live in. They've been blinded by the enemy, the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of anti-God everything, and we have been blinded. People have been blinded from the truth but enjoying their wickedness, enjoying godlessness. And yet God is right. I, there's no way that God, that God exists, yada, yada, yada. But they don't even think about the intricacies of the human body or how many parts make up a human eye or how your brain can, and can speak to your eyes to turn really quick and grab a picture of earth that no camera can ever do. It's just, we, we overlook that because we enjoy what we enjoy more than we enjoy the convictions that God exists. If that wasn't enough, we have special revelation. In theology, we call Jesus and the word of God, the scriptures, special revelation. This is what is said about Jesus in Colossians 1.15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Just so you know, Jesus really did walk this earth. Because there's literally people arguing that Jesus didn't even walk the earth, that he he was a fictional character. I just can't believe that. I mean, there's literally non-Christian sources that say he walked the earth. The Romans, the Greeks, the Jews recorded his life. They even tell, tell about miracles that he's done. And then they even can acknowledge that something changed with the followers after the crucifixion, something changed. They went from fear and hiding to being bold and going out to everywhere. You know what it was? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's evidence everywhere. Be you ready for this? Go to the next scripture for me. John 1, 10 through 12. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, and even today, he gives the right to become children of God. If you will believe in Jesus Christ and accept him, you will become a child of God. You are a new person. You are a believer, a Christian, however you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. You belong to God. You're in relationship with him. Amen. But I want to give you a warning because a lot of people go, why doesn't God just... Make it really obvious for us. He did 2,000 years ago. And he proved it with signs and wonders and miracles. And then he proves it by dying on the cross and then coming back to life and walking around and speaking to the apostles. But no one wants to believe. And a lot of times what you'll find is that people want God on their terms instead of they believing God on his terms. It's because we want God to show himself in some way. But even if he does, will we still believe or will we give in to whatever we want? So there's definitely a fight for our hearts. There's a war for us and our faith, but not just faith that he exists because God isn't looking for you just to believe he exists. He's looking to have a relationship with you. So he gave us his son, Jesus, special revelation. But there's there's an issue there between us and God, and that's the sin. And that relationship takes place because we believe in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sin. We just took communion to remember what this is all, what I'm talking about right now. You can have a relationship with the creator of the earth through Jesus Christ. And lastly, we actually can prove that God exists. We can show that God exists because of our testimonies. Paul himself said this in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Can anyone testify and agree to him with him? You know, yeah, that's me. 
then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You see, your testimony shows that God is there. And that if you seek him, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart, because you've changed. Paul says, in him we live, move, and have our being. I want to keep going because I actually didn't finish the scripture. I'm sorry. Verse 48 says this, or sorry, verse 28 says this, for in him we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol design. Oh, did I read that? I guess I did read that. I'm, my, my apologies. I'm just so hyped. I, st- I try to backtrack. I try to keep you here for another five minutes. The reason why I brought that verse back in, though, I know I realize now, because Paul uses a poet, we are his offspring, meaning we can have a relationship with God. You're not just some clump of cells. You belong to a creator, and he wants to have that relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Well, good things happen here. Verse 32 of the scripture says this in closing. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt. So he lost them at that. But others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them. But some joined him and became believers Among them were Dionysius, a member of the council, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Wow. If you could say, yeah, praise God. If you could say that there's, if there's three people in the world, there you have it. If you could just, you know, sum it up. In in evangelism, there you have it. You have people that are going to laugh at your, at the gospel. You're also going to have people go, hmm, let me look into this more. And then you're going to have some who believe. So don't be discouraged. Think about that. You have only one who maybe mocks or laughs or rejects you completely. You have another group of people who actually are going to go deeper into that. And then you have a group of people who actually believe. God's simply asking us to go share the message of Jesus Christ. To show and share our testimony by how we live and with our words. And I know we're not all apologists. I know we're not all like Paul. But God can still use you. It's interesting. This word today, it's so timely. Because Gideon thought he couldn't be used because he was the weakest and smallest of the clan. And I do believe the enemy wants you to think that God can't use you. No, but he can. It's interesting how so many people come to the Lord in ways that are not intellectual and yet their intellects. What do I mean by that? Answered prayer. The love of a believer. Those things warm people's hearts. If they're intellectuals, if they're philosophers, you know that a lot of times you can't get through to them through reasoning. It's gotta be through the spirit and the weapons of God, which is love and prayer and the Holy Spirit. Do not count yourself out because you're not the Apostle Paul or because you can't quote more than five scriptures or something like that, or you don't know systematic theology because you didn't go to Bible college. It doesn't matter. People have all that stuff and they still don't use it. I know. I went to a Christian college. Only two of my roommates out of the seven, we were in this apartment. Only two of us do what we do today. Now, they could be doing it on their, the layman's terms, so to say. They could be doing it as people of God, but I know where they are, many of them where they are today, and they're not where they used to be, I can say that. We can have all the knowledge and all the abilities and go to church all our life, we can memorize scripture, but it doesn't mean that we're deeply troubled or deeply moved to do something about it. And God is calling us to be like that, even with the little bit we know and the little bit we experienced, amen? But I will say this, don't stop in your education, keep learning keep growing. There's plenty of free online courses online. There's many ways we can direct you as well. Amen? Let me stand together because I have two verses to show you to help inspire us to go out. In 
If you're in this room, by the way, and you do not have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, I'm pretty sure he's calling you home today. Amen. And I want to encourage you to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to repent of your ways, to repent of sin, repent of believing in any other gods, and choose Jesus today. And we're ready to help you with that. Our prayer team's gonna come down. We're ready to walk you through that, pray with you, help you understand it, give you some resources to help you grow and understand even more. We're ready to give those out to you. We have them up here in the front. But I wanna read these scriptures for us as believers today. 1 Peter 1.8, be encouraged by this. You love him even though you have never seen him. Isn't that true? I mean, you weren't around 2,000 years ago. Last time I checked, neither was I. I didn't see Jesus, but I believe in the, the testimony of the apostles. I believe in the word of God. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. That's because Jesus lives in you. The spirit of God dwells in you. How about this verse? This is so key. We often quote John 13. But what about this one? No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. Amen. So we often quote John 13 about if we love one another, the world will know we are his disciples. Beautiful scripture. But what about that one? That if we love each other, God's love continues to go in us, lives in us. God lives in us and God's love grows in us and people notice a difference in us. See, that's how you get people to, to see Jesus is through loving one another, amen? Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you, God, that you've made yourself known to us and yes, deep down, we would love for you just to show yourself to us even today the way you did then. But Lord, you did it and you gave us your word, and you gave us the testimony of your apostles, and we can trust you as your word. So Lord, we have childlike faith today, and we trust you as our loving father, not just our creator. And we're more than a creature. We're a person that you died for and you love. And you long to have a fellowship with, a, fellowship with us and relationship with us, so God, I pray you would draw those who have not believed in you who have maybe been blinded by the other gods in this world or the other things in this world. God, I pray that we would confess you as our Lord and Savior, repent of our ways, believe in Jesus Christ. And for us, God, we are comforted knowing that even though we have not seen you, we love you because you loved us first. I pray that your love will be fully expressed in us and through us to those around us. God, break our hearts for what we see in our world, but not just break us and then we sit there, break us and help us move to action. We love you, God, and we thank you that you go with us, that you evangelize with us, that you go before us in preparing hearts. May we not look down on the small opportunities or the big ones. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Glory to God.